Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that as we come to your word, that you would open our hearts and our minds, open our eyes, accept my surrender, that we might hear from you what it is that you have to show us today. Speak to our hearts, reveal yourself, and for that we thank you in advance. Amen. Talking about um, having a life that's defined by love, and it's fairly simply put, um, the world, the folks around you do not need to know a new set of rules. Um, I, don't, I don't think that there's any great wisdom that's going to change anybody's world in terms of intellectual information. Certainly knowledge has, is so freely and widely available that there's really not a, a big price on information these days. But what, what people need, what we really desperately need is, is some sense of hope. So we live in a world where fear tends to dominate what we do. Um, and if you, don't, if you don't believe that, just open your eyes a little bit wider. Sometimes we think that we're just being wise when so often what the truth is, is we, are, we allow fear to become such a part of our world. And the, the tragedy, when we, when we live a life that is defined by fear, the tragedy is that our life gets smaller the things that we can enjoy and appreciate, the, the, the relationships that we have, our lives get smaller. They become constricted. And fear squeezes all of the joy out of life. And we end up just a shell of a person. And the other thing that it does is it shrinks the world. Our world becomes smaller and smaller because without, without something else, if we're just relying on our human resources, the only way we can find uh, safety from fear is in what is familiar to us, what is known to us, what seems tangible and real. And so we end up in this world that's just so tiny. And the tragedy, the real tragedy, is that when people look to Christians, when they're looking for the source of hope, what Jesus died for, what Jesus rose from the dead for is to conquer that thing that we fear because all of our human fear is grounded in one of two things. It's either grounded in a fear of consequences, which is what death is essentially, consequences, or we're in fear of separation, which is what sin does. Sin separates us from God. And our fears are based on a fear of separation. We don't always, we're not always aware that we're afraid of being separated from God. But, but at the core of who we are, that's the truth. Jesus died to conquer that fear. Jesus died because there is one way and only one way to address that issue, the issue that we have from fear. Remember we talked last week about Genesis, how Adam and Eve, right after they sinned, what did they do? They tried to make clothes for themselves out of fig leaves and they hid from the God who created them because they were afraid they were afraid of punishment because they had broken the law, and they were hiding themselves, separating themselves from God. And life outside the Garden of Eden, life outside of God's will, is a life of separation. What we need is to connect with the God who loves us. And 1 John helps us see what a life looks at that is defined by love. And folks, our role here on earth is to be witnesses. Make no mistake. Jesus didn't keep us alive to protect God's word or to teach the law or even to teach the Bible. Jesus said, listen, here's the thing. As the disciples were watching him leave, last words, Jesus says, I want you to be my witnesses. Witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the end in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what do witnesses do? Witnesses only, only speak to the truth that they have experienced. A witness can't say, I know God changed Tom's life. I can see that God changed Tom's life, but that's not a witness, that's just an observation. Tom can tell others how God's changed his life. I can tell others how God's changed my life. That's what our role is and what people, when they hear from you and I, how God has helped us live a life defined by love and not by fear, when they see in you that you've broken free from some of those things that we all fear, 
That's something others want, and that's something we have to give. We can offer people freedom from fear in Jesus Christ if we can get their attention. We're talking about this as a, this series is like, imagine a biopic, the story of your life being one that's defined by triumph over fear, defined by love as it triumphs over fear. And 1 John gives us verse four, chapter 418, the theme verse for this whole series is that fear, there is no love and there is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. Perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love drives out fear. So as people who are afraid, we seek the truth. And, and <clears throat> unfortunately, this is a battle, right? This is about spiritual warfare. The reality is we have a holy God, but God has been threatened, challenged by the enemy Satan. It's the truth. Jesus spent lots of times, time dealing with demons. Now, I'm not suggesting there's a demon behind every door and that we have to run around f- afraid of demons. It's not like a whole bunch of little guys in red suits with pointy tails show up. No, that's not the way fear works. It's insidious. It's secret. It's propaganda. And we got connected to Kanye. We got connected to D-Day, right? Get connected to D-Day, I became a student of history, particularly history about World War II. More specifically, history about World War II right around that time of D-Day because that was relevant. And what I discovered is how often propaganda made the difference. Propaganda was the attempt that each side made to mislead the other side. If we could get if we could get Hitler to not know where the battlefront was going to be, he would defuse his resources and we would have a better chance of winning. That's the point of propaganda. They made all those little, <clears throat> all those little dummies, drop them from airplanes. They weren't real paratroopers, but they created the illusion that there was a large invasion force, much larger invasion force being dropped in than was actually being dropped in. That's propaganda. That's leading astray. And our enemy in this battle uses propaganda all the time because our enemy, the one who promotes fear, cannot create. The only thing that Satan can do, the only thing our enemy can do is corrupt. And so the attempt to mislead us, to distract us, to create in us a sense that a certain thing would keep us safe or that other things are unsafe and we need to be afraid. And that propaganda we can see Let's look at chapter 2, verses 20 to 25. This is an important thing. It's critical for us to understand this, that Satan's mission is to undermine God's sovereignty and to capture God's kingdom. He can't. Satan's been defeated by God in the heavens, but Satan's been given freedom for a period of time to be on this earth, and his battlefront is the church. We are, the threat, we, are, we are the threat to Satan's uh, kingdom. We're the threat to Satan's plan. His desire, very simply, is to separate us from God. Satan can't have your life in Christ. But know this, spiritual warfare can silence your witness and thus make you an ineffective soldier. If Satan can distract and confuse and generate fear, we circle the wagons, we separate ourselves, and we start saying, they're not with us because they say this or believe that. It's tragic, heartbreaking to me as a pastor. Every town that I've gone into, there, have been, there has been some sense within the community of the, of the lay people. There has been some sense within the community that local churches compete with each other. The number of times I've heard that statement Oh, your competition across town, comparing what one church does with what another church does. I'm telling you folks, that is is our enemy fostering propaganda, trying to tell us that what we do and the, the details about how we do things matters to God. It doesn't. God, God wants us to witness. And that witness to love is one that is focused and absolutely life changing because it shapes who we are. In Christ, I can love anybody. There are some folks that I find it hard to like, and I'm sure that there are a lot of folks that find me hard to like, 
But we don't have to like each other. That's not our witness. What we do need to do is love each other and recognize, more importantly, that the God who saved us can save every single other person and died to make that real. That God didn't send his son to save those who would follow the rules. That God didn't send his son to save, save those who know 10 or 8 or 12 or 15 or 30 or 300 different truths. God didn't send his son to save just those few that would do it this way. God sent his son to save every sinner in every place and throughout all of time. And some of us will never accept that. Some will go to their graves rejecting that love. That's their choice. But our role in this drama is to present an image, a story of triumph over fear by love. And that's critical because Satan would like to plant lies, lies in the minds of those who haven't found him. Some of those lies are really simple ones, like what you have to wear to go to church. Should, it, should, should we ever be okay with somebody feeling like they have to dress a certain way to be a part of worship? Should that ever be something that matters to us? Should we, also, should we not be heartbroken if we hear somebody suggest that their apparel qualifies them to be in the presence of God's people? We ought to re that ought to really disturb us. If somebody says that churches compete with one another, that we're right and they're wrong, that should disturb us because we have one God and one Savior, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And just so if any of us forget it's pointed out to us in Romans that all have sinned and fallen short of what? God's glory. We all have sinned and fallen short. If people understand that we know that we have sinned and fallen short, if people understand that we recognize our, our life comes as a gift from a Savior that was so passionate about protecting us, about saving us. Because you see, salvation isn't about taking away our ability to sin. God could have made us with, without the gift of will. We could not have choices. We could be like oak trees and only ever produce acorns and reproduce as other oak trees. We could be a very pure kingdom. If God wanted cookie cutter believers and cookie cutter followers, he could have made us all the same color, all the same height, all the same weight, speaking all the same languages, doing all the same things and believing a certain set of rules and we could never violate any of those. That's not what God chose. God chose to create a diverse group of people. No two of us are alike, but every one of us is loved. And we need to know that, folks, because if this is a battle, if there is, in fact, spiritual warfare going on around us, if indeed Satan is attacking us because he can't beat God any longer, if those things are true, and if Jesus Christ is real, then we have to know who is our ally. Whose side are we on? Because that's, that's when the chips are down, that's the question you ask, right? That's what you need to know. If it, if it comes to the absolute basics, you need to know. Whose side are you on? More importantly, we need to know the answer to this question. Are we on the same side? Because I think it's pretty obvious if you watch the news and listen to what folks are saying that people are taking sides. And they're taking sides over things, I can promise you, break God's heart. When God's children act as if a certain type of doctrine, denomination, whatever you want to call it, when we act as if some are in and some are out, you have to believe this or reject this or do this to be one of God's chosen, I gotta tell you, that breaks God's heart. I know that God watches us and says, why are you all fighting with each other? Why do people in the same church community, the same church family, ever speak ill of each other? Why would, you know, there, there, I, I don't see a lot of it in this congregation, and that's a blessing. But we all know the stereotype, right? It's not common, not uncommon for people to say, yeah, I know what churches are like. They're full of hypocrites. They'll tell you that they love you, but they'll stab you in the back when they're not looking. Now, I don't know where that reputation comes from, but it can't be all a lie because it continues to get propagated. Churches 
are full of people who are fallen human beings. And it's God's grace that restores us. And it's God's grace that brings us together. And when we focus on God's grace and when we understand that we are in a battle and that we need to live lives that are defined not by fear, not by allegiance, not by, by identity, not by what is the same as us, not by those who think like we do, not by a narrow set of rules, but lives that are defined by love and it's a love that is so passionate that God said, they're not getting it, Jesus you need to go down there and show them how much we love you, what, how much we love them. And you need to live a life among them and take no special privileges for yourself. Jesus didn't divide us. Jesus didn't say these ones are acceptable. As a matter of fact, he spent his life going to the people that the religious community thought were unacceptable. He spent his life touching the people that everyone said, you better not touch them. He spent his life stepping outside of what they thought were the most important laws. They challenged Jesus about eating, doing work on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, you guys don't get this right. Sabbath was God's gift to you, not your gift to God. Sabbath isn't made for us to prove that we can obey God. God gave us the rule of Sabbath because God in creating us knows what we need. Jesus understood that we need a day of rest and he, and he allowed us to see that, that God gave us that gift. It's not a restriction, it's a privilege. So our Savior died, not just for us, but for everyone, everyone, even those who reject him, even those who would call themselves openly enemies of the cross, they're still ones that Jesus loves dearly. And his heart breaks when he is rejected by anyone. Folks, we ought never revel in the loss of a life or the separation of someone from a church, or enmity between believers, or broken families. We ought never be glad for any kind of warfare or factionalism. It's one thing to disagree, but we have no business saying negative things about any human being. Speaking words that sound judgmental, let alone words that are judgmental, speaking down to or about any human being that's ever lived, regardless of how vile we might think their crimes are or how large we might think their threats are, when we do that, we are not living a life defined by love. We're living a life defined by fear. We're living a life that says, hey, listen, I'm not guilty of that, so I feel pretty good about who I am. When we, when we speak judgment about others, what we're essentially saying is, that's a sin I don't think I'm guilty of, and so I'm gonna say it's an important one. That way I can feel like I fit. Those are... Those are behaviors that are associated with a life defined by fear. If we are in a battle, if it really matters what we do, if our witness makes a difference in this world, if people are paying attention to our lives, we need to know the answer to the question, whose side are we on? And it isn't about communion, it isn't about ordination, it isn't about denominations, it isn't about a translation of the Bible, it isn't about which text is most important. It isn't about political orientation, sexual orientation, theological orientation. It's not about when you're born in time or space. It's not about what continent you're born on. It's not about when you lived or who your parents are. It's about one thing and one thing only. And 1 John makes it clear. <clears throat> Let me read it to you, if I can find it. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. This is the central truth. This isn't every answer. This is the central truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? Here's the thing. Here's what we define our allegiance by. Whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. The only thing that should distinguish us as believers from anyone else, whether they be other believers or other people in the world, is where do we stand on the person of Jesus Christ? Is he the true Son of God? He is the most true and real thing I know. The person that is the most real to me in my world is not Lynn, it's Jesus Christ. And I know he's real and I know he's true and I know 
although I can't explain the mechanics of it, and I'm marveled by the truth of it. Jesus Christ came to this earth and he lived for a period of time. He was born of a virgin and somebody who was not very popular or very important before this. Someone that most people didn't take note of, Mary, and another guy, Joseph, who happens to be in the line of David, but wasn't making a big deal out of that when Jesus came around. I know that Jesus Christ was born, that he lived and that he died. I know that he taught. I know that he died by choice, not by force. That it was his choice to fulfill his destiny, which is to purchase my eternity. And I know that the only peace I have in any of that is accepting it. I know that to be true. And so if you can claim Christ with me, we are on the same team, period. And nothing else that you can do and nothing else that I can do can separate us from the reality of a life defined by love. Now, for those who don't know Christ, the question is not how we keep away from them. The question becomes, how can I prove to you how much Jesus loves me and how he can love you. Because I'll tell you what, every one of us at some place in our hearts feels unlovable. And if, if we can break through that and say, I know, I've felt unlovable before, but the miracle is I know that I'm loved. Not that I think I'm loved, not that the Bible preaches that I'm loved, but I know that I'm loved. I know that I'm loved because Jesus has done something in me to set me free from fear, to set me free from the things that make my life smaller. That doesn't mean I'm comfortable with everything, and that certainly doesn't mean I can answer everything, but it does mean the only thing that matters for us to walk hand in hand, for us to join together in trying to live a life of victory defined by love, the only thing that matters is the thing that identifies that we're on the same team. You know, I discovered this piece of information this last year in preparing for the um, D-Day reenactment. And it's, it's funny to me, as I shared this, like it was a big revelation to me, all the people who are D-Day geeks who have been doing this you know, history all along, and even people that were just general World War II, they knew this, I didn't. I discovered in doing the research this year that when they got ready for the invasion, they took all the airplanes and they, they painted invasion stripes on them. You know why they did that? Because from the ground, they had so many different countries and so many different air forces involved in trying to vanquish that foe and trying to be triumphant in that battle. There were so many different planes from different countries with different pilots in the air that they painted three stripes on the underneath of them, black and white, to identify them as part of the invasion force. So you didn't need to know who was flying it. You didn't need to know what kind of a plane it was. You just need to know, if you saw those invasion stripes, they're on your side. Don't shut them down. Don't shoot them down. And I heard, found out that, that Great Britain ran out of black and white paint because the invasion force was so large, they didn't have enough paint to paint stripes, and they were desperate to get those invasion stripes on every plane. They might not have been perfect, and they might not have been artistic, but they were life-saving, because they told those guys that were going into that battle whose side those planes were on. Folks, Jesus Christ is our invasion stripe as believers. He's the only one that matters. And every church and every believer and every life and every place is going to look a little bit different. And that diversity is part of God's plan because he can't save the world. He can't save everybody through Russ. I've said this tongue-in-cheek, but I believe it to be absolutely true. A church populated entirely by people like me would be a nightmare. I don't want to be a part of a group of people that are all like me. It would not be a good thing. It wouldn't be healthy. I learn from people who aren't like me. I learn when my positions are challenged, when my mind is open, when my eyes <clears throat> are amazed. I learn when, when I'm misunderstood. I learn by being a part of people who are diverse. And so, very simply this. We need to recognize that spiritual warfare is real and that fear is what Satan uses to try to discourage us and let us believe that we're losing some sort of a battle. But the thing that endures, the thing that matters, the person of Jesus Christ is eternal. He was there before the beginning. He's present as my savior. He will be there to the end and his history is my destiny if I claim him. Will you pray with me? God, we're aware 
we're aware of the perception people around us have. They wonder if you're real because if you're real, how would you let us suffer? Let us recognize that propaganda and be honest that we all suffer. Not to diminish another's experience, but to establish solidarity that we are all lost people in need of a savior. That regardless of how long we've known Jesus Christ, we still need to live each and every day as a person in need of a savior. Because your work in us is never done until you return. We continue to live a life. Help us to seek out a life defined by love, a life that shows triumph over the fears of those in the world around us, the fears that we may have, the things that hold us back and that keep us down. Today, Father, if, if there are any of us who don't know that Jesus Christ is our definition of whose we are, that we might not agree on every detail, but we know that Jesus Christ is our Savior and that he is your true and only Son, I pray that there are those who need to surrender, that they would find that freedom to surrender, to simply ask Jesus to be in their lives and become real for them. And Father, we own that the church has not always behaved nicely and that we are guilty of acting hypocritically. Forgive us for that and help us to create opportunities for folks that have legitimate concerns about the way they've been treated or the way they perceive your church to be. And help us to take that responsibility and love those folks, praying for the time that they can find out that you love them as well. In all of these things, may your will be done in and through us. Amen.